Good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this, I am Stuart McIntosh, the Executive Director of the Group of 30, and I'm especially honoured to join you this evening to introduce our keynote speaker on international matters. Now, as you know, NABE always endeavours to bring you the great and the good, talking about issues not just from a domestic US perspective, but also from an international perspective, bringing their understanding, knowledge and insight to bear. And it's particularly an honour tonight to introduce our speaker for tonight's keynote. Harihiko Kuroda is the Governor of the Bank of Japan, a role he, is, uh, he has uh, performed since 2013. He has a BA from the University of Tokyo and a Master's in Economics from the University of Oxford. He started his career in the Ministry of Finance. He then went on to the International Monetary Fund before returning to the Ministry of Finance and taking up the role of Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs, a key role for Japan there. He then went on to be Special Advisor to the Cabinet of Prime Minister Koizumi and ultimately to be President of the Asian Development Bank before he was appointed as uh, Governor of the Bank of Japan. We're absolutely delighted that he would join us this evening and talk to us this evening. And I want to just add one additional sort of note vis-a-vis uh, -vis the governor. Some of, many of you will not know that, uh, uh, that the governor is especially uh, 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 mindful of the requests of, of parliamentarians. And I would suspect that he has, speaks more to his parliamentarians than perhaps any other central bank governor that I know. I know he speaks to the diet perhaps scores of times a year in quite quite contrast with the US chair of the Federal Reserve Bank who limits their conversations to, with uh, the parliamentarians mm -hmm. much more but I think that just <laughs> that just talks to the mm -hmm. way in which the governor uh, deals with the incredible weight of responsibility that he has been having on his shoulders helping to lead Japan, helping to deliver for the economy of Japan, helping to ensure that his economy and the people of Japan prosper. And I'm extremely pleased to have him tonight to talk to us, particularly about the situation we all face today. He's going to talk to us about COVID-19 and the global economy, impact and challenges from an Asian perspective. Governor, thank you so much, please. Uh, Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, it is, of course, a great honor to be invited to speak at the 20, uh, sorry, 62nd annual meeting of the National Association for Business Economics. The worldwide spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has had a severe impact on the global economy. Uh, people all over the world are coming together and making a concerted effort to deal with this economic shock. At the same time, we are seeing a global determination to overcome the current crisis and turn it into an opportunity to achieve future growth. This year, the theme, Global Reset, Economics, Business and Policy in the Pandemic, addresses not just the current issues, but also the medium and the long-term implications of COVID-19. From this perspective, I would like to talk today about the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy and the relevant medium and long-term challenges with a particular focus on Asia. Based on my experience as Vice Minister for International Affairs at the Ministry of Finance in Japan, President of the Asian Development Bank and Governor of the Bank of Japan, let me explore how best to overcome the challenges posed by COVID-19 and bring the global economy back on the path of growth. The global spread of COVID-19 has significantly restrained economic activity worldwide. In many economies, the GDP growth rate for April, June 2020 registered significant negative growth. Since then, with many countries and regions gradually resuming economic activity, 
economies have started to pick up. However, the pace of improvement has remained moderate. The spread of COVID-19 has not yet subsided globally, and many economies continue to be severely affected. A full-fledged recovery seems much farther down the road. Economic conditions in Asia also remain severe. According to the Asian Development Bank's recent Asian Development Outlook 2020 update, Released in uh, September, the developing Asian countries will suffer a contraction for the first time in about 60 years. COVID-19 has affected Asian economies mainly through three channels. First, a decrease in exports, reflecting suppressed global economic activity. Second, a decrease in inbound-related demand against the background of entry restriction measures and policies reducing travel. And third, a decrease in domestic private consumption, reflecting dinner suspensions and people refraining from going out outside. A fall in global and domestic demand has had a negative impact on corporate profits, wages, and business fixed investment. However, the severity of the impact has been mixed across Asian economies, depending on such factors as the extent of COVID-19 contagion, their industrial composition, and their room for fiscal maneuver. All in all, the downturn of the Asian economy has been moderate in comparison with other regions. This can be explained partly by the relatively moderate uh, status of infection for most Asian countries. Another contributing factor is the increased global demand for online services and the accompanying solid global demand for IT-related goods, which account for a large proportion of Asian economies. On the financial front, at the onset of COVID-19, some economies in the region experienced substantial capital outflows. However, Asian financial markets have gradually uh, regained the stability, and the overall impact on capital flows has been moderate compared with that of the Asian currency crisis in the 1990s or the global financial crisis in the late 2000s. Asian financial markets have been able to weather the impact of COVID-19 in part due to increased resilience from the buildup of foreign currency reserves and also to the swift and aggressive implementation of fiscal and monetary policy measures. Financial support through region, regional and international cooperation mechanisms, which have been developed and enhanced over the years, has provided an additional layer of protection. Asian economies have been the driver of global growth over the past few decades. The strength of Asian economies has been supported by three driving factors or driving forces. First is the development of advanced regional supply chain networks spanning raw materials and the intermediate goods as well as final goods. Second is the progress made in trade liberalization through the concerted enhancement of trade agreements both with and outside the region. Third is the self-sustained growth of domestic demand supported by rising incomes from increases in production and trading activities. The inter interaction of these three driving forces has enabled Asia to grow both as a manufacturing base for factory Asia and the consumer base, uh, consumer Asia. However, 
COVID-19 has exposed some potential weaknesses in these driving forces. Supply chains in Asia have been disrupted due to strict public health measures, such as stay-at-home orders and businesses and production suspensions. Asian and global trading volume have declined steeply and demand in the travel and tourism sectors has virtually evaporated. Domestic demand has been weak in many Asian economies, reflecting the deterioration in employment and income conditions. In the short term, we need to contain the spread of COVID-19 while supporting economic activity. To this end, support measures for households and businesses that have been hard hit need to be continued. But it is in times like this that we should keep moving forward and envision what may come after the crisis to prepare ourselves for the next shock and achieve sustainable economic growth. In this sense, it is important to Asia to continue strengthening its role in the global economy as factory Asia and consumer Asia. Strengthening economic growth in the Asian region has uh, supported the global economy in its recovery from the global financial crisis. In 2008, Asian economies accounted for about 30% of global GDP, but by 2019, this has increased to about 40%. Therefore, it is only natural that the world looks to Asia with expectation for its support and for it to be a driver of economic recovery in the current economic downturn. What then needs to be done for the Asian economy to gain momentum toward growth? Two key factors or two key concepts that often appear in recent debates are resilience and agility, i.e. resilience against shocks and agility in terms of responding to changes in environment. I will elaborate on Asian firms' responses based on these two concepts. The recent pandemic has exposed certain vulnerabilities in Asian supply chain networks, as many businesses have suffered disruptions to their supply chains and the decline in production. In response to this challenge, Asian farms have already started to reform their supply chains. In this regard, farms are not focusing exclusively on reshoring, rather, in order to make their supply chain more resilient to shocks, they are looking to disperse and diversify production locations and procurement sources and to establish multi-layered supply chains. Farms are also strengthening supply chain management to enhance agility in terms of responding to changes in environment by, for instance, visualizing the procurement production and supply situations of their particular business bases. Asia has traditionally been susceptible to supply chain disruption caused by many natural disasters, and some Asian farms have strengthened their supply chains accordingly. These farms have been rewarded with a swift recovery from the recent shock. Moving forward, more will leverage the lessons learned recently and take measures to further strengthen their supply chains. COVID-19 has also brought significant changes to various aspects of our daily lives. This has led to changes in demand for goods and services. To explore this new demand, many firms, including in Asia, have begun to shift and strengthen their business focus accordingly, even as they continue their fight against COVID-19. More than ever, companies must be 
agile in order to adapt to the changing environment and capture new demand arising from the expansion of digital networks, online healthcare and education services, as well as the growth of e-commerce. In the longer term, these business reforms are expected to boost productivity. Asia's uh, services sector has long been noted for its low productivity. However, the landscape has been changing dramatically in recent years, as illustrated by the especially strong growth of e-commerce in Asia. This is expected to improve the resilience of consumer Asia by generating new consumption and investment, as well as increasing wages. From a longer term perspective, Asia must address its challenges in order to achieve sustainable economic growth. The key to achieving this growth is to work toward realizing an inclusive green and digital economy. While this will involve a great deal of time and effort, the rewards are expected to outweigh the cost. There is no trade-off involved between moving toward an inclusive green and digital economy and achieving economic growth over the longer term. Rather, they are complementary. One of the barriers to achieving an inclusive, inclusive growth or inclusive economy is the insufficient development of social security system in many developing and emerging Asian countries. Gaps in social protection not only made it difficult to respond to the recent pandemic, but also widened economic inequality. Developing and emerging Asian economies we need to find effective means to enhance their healthcare and social security systems and to promote investment in human capital, including education. This effort will improve financial inclusiveness and in turn act as a stepping stone to decreasing poverty. On the financial front, Progress in financial inclusion is becoming more crucial to the promotion of economic growth and the alleviation of, alleviation of inequality. Some regions in Asia are particularly vulnerable to the economic and social consequences of natural disasters and rising sea levels resulting from climate change. Therefore, the region has been striving to achieve the appropriate balance between economic development and environmental preservation by strengthening environmental regulation and building eco-friendly physical infrastructures. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to an increased focus on climate change issues. Making the economy greener is a global shared by, uh, is a goal shared by both advanced and developing economies. In response to the demands of society and in order to achieve economic growth over the medium to long term, efforts should be stepped up on a global basis. As for digitalization, uh, this brings the greatest benefits to those who previously lacked sufficient access to goods, services, and information. In terms of financial services, FinTech not only facilitates financial inclusion, but also stimulates economic activity by increasing investment and creating demand in relevant sectors. Asia accounts for more than 60% of all fintech-related patents filed in the 20 years to 2018 and offers huge potential in the fintech sector. The recent pandemic has accelerated the move toward digitalization. It has become increasingly important that 
government and private sector collaborate to further pursue initiatives to facilitate digitalization, focusing both on developing physical infrastructure and on legal and regulatory frameworks. Lastly, I would like to talk about regional cooperation in Asia. Regional cooperation in Asia is conducted through various platforms, including ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3. There are also frameworks such as APEC that extend to, across, uh, extend to Asia's outside, <laughs> extend to areas outside Asia including the United States. In the financial context, the Chenmai Initiative Marketalization uh, uh, or CMIM, a regional financing arrangement involving Japan, China, Korea, and the 10 ASEAN member countries has made steady progress in enhancing its effectiveness, thereby contributing to financial stability within the region. Central bank fora, including EMIAP and CSEN, have also been effective. The COVID-19 pandemic has high highlighted the importance of regional as well as international cooperation in implementing appropriate measures in response to economic shocks. External shocks with far-reaching effects, such as climate change, also require coordinated Going forward, regional and international cooperation will become even more essential. Today, I have discussed the impact and the challenges posed by COVID-19 on the global economy with a focus on Asian economies. Many of the challenges Asian economies now face are common to the global economy. The issues are wide ranging are not easy to tackle. However, by overcoming and learning from these challenges, the global economy will be better positioned to achieve sustainable and balanced development. There is a phrase in, in Japanese, fueki ryuko, which refer to the attitude of accepting and adapting to change even while continuing to uphold the basics that do not change. The recent pandemic has uh, prompted us to rethink our views and actions. Globalization itself, which was the basis of global economic growth before the crisis, is now being questioned. And some have argued for the need to rewind. However, no matter how it may change in form and structure, the fundamental importance of globalization to the global economy will not change. I have had the honor today to connect virtually with the global audience, but in terms of human interaction, the significance of face-to-face -face communication is unchanged. Now we are faced with these challenge of, uh, of identifying those of our views and actions that should not change and those that should in order to adapt to the new environment. I very much look forward to exchanging views with you again face to face in the near future. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Governor. That was uh, really very interesting, incredibly wide ranging. And I really found your essentially your call to arms about globalization, but also about the missing things that we all miss about the current crisis. Very heartening at the end. And I, I indeed uh, share your views very much so. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, a question about the, the, sort of the, the other long term, one of the other long term challenges we're facing and something I know that you've considered a lot, both in your current role, but also uh, when you were president of the Asian Development Bank, that is to say, whether there are uh, lessons that from, from your 
countries grappling with the demographic uh, reality of an aging society as one of those one of those inevitables that you're you're facing, and how we can learn from you and what we might uh, do better because we're all facing that uh, that change in our demographic structure. So that's mm -hmm. ongoing, not with notwithstanding what's been happening. Uh, in the short term with COVID. Can you talk to that and how you think we can address it better? Yeah, as you know, uh, Japan is one of the uh, most uh, rapidly aging society. And uh, we have been uh, <coughs> discussing about uh, how to tackle with uh, problems arising from uh, aging uh, society. I must say that uh, I'm not uh, so uh, pessimistic about uh, the uh, impact of uh, population aging on the society as well as the economy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think encouraging this digitalization will be, uh, will be a driving force for raising uh, growth potential. And uh, in order to boost innovation, it is important to enhance the education of, of course, younger generations and uh, provide further opportunities for re-education for those who are middle-aged and, and elderly. Uh, not just uh, digitalization technology and so on and so forth, but also in wide-ranging uh, uh, new uh, issues arising from uh, digitalization. And also I think uh, the, the, uh, uh, under the abenomics, so-called abenomics, uh, labor participation of uh, uh, elderly people, uh, women, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, has increased uh, tremendously. For instance, uh, uh, labor participation of women in Japan is now higher than uh, that in the United States. <laughs> uh, this is uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the way to, to overcome uh, uh, aging population or uh, declining uh, population and so on. So, so I think uh, we have been addressing this issue. We have been uh, challenging this uh, program. And, uh, and also, I think uh, we can see the way to overcome the negative impact coming from uh, population aging. And I think uh, even uh, in uh, developing Eastern countries, the emerging Asian countries, uh, population aging has already started in some, and, and even in South Asia, uh, population aging would soon uh, start to, to arrive. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, potentially universal issue in all Asian countries, and probably in all <laughs> countries in the world. So I, I think. Uh, I, I must say that uh, we, we should not be uh, so pessimistic, but we have to deal with this uh, uh, problem uh, squarely and with uh, determination. Here, yeah, yeah. Let me let me turn back and, and maybe put two subjects together mm -hmm. for, your, for, mm -hmm. for your final question, which mm -hmm. is you talked a lot about. And rightly so about well the 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 the, the sort of the, the the impetus for change within Asian economies and within the Japanese economy coming mm. out of COVID, and you also mm. talked about the importance of greening the recovery. Mm. So perhaps you could say a little bit about how you where you see those that that happening. You know, are there particular industries, particular areas where you see. Uh, mm. Um, that, that taking root, the change taking root that we, as you say, all need to uh, engage on, the sustainable recovery that is essential. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, uh, 
climate change issue or how to realize a green economy. Uh, uh, these uh, issues are really uh, uh, huge. And uh, I must say, probably the most uh, challenging issue faced by the global economy, including, uh, of course, Asian economy. And uh, I think uh, two things are most important. One, of course, uh, uh, we have to uh, develop alternative energy. We have to save energy. We have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, substantially. And uh, as you may know, already the Japanese government uh, uh, this year decided uh, and established uh, kind of action plan, uh, so-called environment uh, innovation strategy to foster technological innovation for a carbon neutral economy. So I think these kind of uh, 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 efforts are needed in not only in uh, developed economies, but also developing and emerging economies as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important points. Uh, 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 and of course, uh, not just uh, uh, developing alternative energy or uh, reducing uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases by technological means and so on, so, but also the entire economy must be adjusted to such a kind of uh, 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 effort. And uh, the financial sector is no exception. And already, as you know, the financial uh, community uh, efforts have uh, started to how to evaluate the, the, the climate risk for the financial sector and how to make financial sector sector resilient, robust uh, against, uh, against uh, climate uh, risk and so on. And so th these efforts, entire economic uh, system effort uh, is needed. On the other hand, as I just mentioned, some Asian countries are very vulnerable to uh, sea level rise and so on. So, so adaptation uh, is also important for uh, particularly small island economies and so on and so forth. And I think this is a matter uh, for uh, uh, economic aid or support uh, provided by the international community. So these two are quite important. Well, thank you very much, Governor. I'm afraid I've run past your time already, <laughs> and, but I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time. It's been a pleasure to hear your sweeping view and get your call to arms to defend globalization and reimagine globalization for the green tomorrow. I want to send you on behalf of the NAID members, hundreds of NAID members around the world who are listening to us and watching us today, our very best and stay safe at a distance. We look forward to seeing you in person before too long. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.